Hello, my friends. You know, I know you guys know this, but I just want to say, you know, God has an intense love for the human race. You know, he created us. He breathed life into us. We are like the pinnacle of his creation. We are his children. He is the one who is working everything out for our good. You know, as Romans 8, 28 tells us. Early on, though, his creation rebelled. And out Eve, you know, she just had to eat what she was forget, forbidden to eat, right? And I can't really fault Eve. You know, I've done the same thing countless times throughout the years. I think each of us would probably have had a different kind of tree displaying whatever our favorite tempting food is. Uh, mine would have been a cinnamon crunch bagel tree, but I haven't had one of those in 10 years, praise God. The point is, God told both Adam and Eve not to eat of that one tree, and we all knows, <laughs> we all know this, what happens when we are told, don't do what we desperately want to do. Yep, Eve did it anyway. And of course, there was quite a bit of encouragement from that old snake, right? Her rebellion and Adam's participation in that particular act brought sin into the world. Now, the crazy thing to me is that God knew that would happen. God knows everything. He stands outside of time. He sees everything in one fell swoop from Eve to me to you and beyond. He sees the beginning to where we are and past that. He sees all because he always has been and always will be. Psalm 91 through 2 and verse 4 say, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has gone by, or like a watch in the night. So God is an entirely different being from us. He's our creator, and we owe him our allegiance. Yet Adam and Eve, who actually walked and talked with God, sinned. They did something God told them not to do. And at the time, I'm sure this didn't seem like such a big deal to Eve or to Adam. She was just kind of checking out what she wanted for breakfast. And there was this delicious looking item hanging on that tree. After all, it was just breakfast, surely. She could eat that just one time. What would it hurt? It's really the same thing I did years ago when God told me not to eat sugar and I didn't listen. I didn't see it as sin. After all, we have to eat, don't we? <laughs> I didn't think that anything I ate could be counted as sin. I thought that was in the category of my own choice. I'd kind of forgotten about Eve at this point. <laughs> However, because God told me not to, and I acknowledged what he said, then what I did, when I did eat what he told me not to, it was sin for me. Now, God didn't stop loving Adam and Eve, and he didn't stop loving me either. Instead, he gave, he gave Adam and Eve consequences and my consequences were just gaining so much weight that I couldn't hardly even walk. But, you know, consequences is what any good father does for his children when they don't obey him. The issue here was not the consequences for them, but the consequences they introduced into all of humanity, you and me included. So basically, a landslide of sin and wickedness entered the world
because of that one action. This didn't take God by surprise either. He introduced the law, letting people know what to do and what not to do in clear language. And if they didn't do what he said, he provided a way out through offering sacrifices if they were repentant. He did that because he loved them. He loves us. His love covered them, provided a way out of any sin they had committed. They could now make a choice between good and evil. And because God is holy and hates wickedness, he wanted to provide a way back to him when they disobeyed. In Psalms 5, 4 through 5, David says, O oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. And then Psalms 11, 5 adds, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. This doesn't sound like the God I know. He hates with a passion. That just doesn't sound like God. However, all through the scriptures, he tells us that he hates evil and the evil one who loves to drag humanity into rebellion against God. The only way out of sinning and doing evil is to accept Jesus and follow God. And if we do, he will lead, guide, and protect us. Our lives will be blessed. Now, it may or may not be monetary blessings, but it will definitely be blessed in our total satisfaction of life. So this is how David describes it in Psalms 145, 7 through 9. <clears throat> our hearts bubble over as we celebrate the fame of your marvelous beauty, bringing blessings to our hearts. We shout with ecstatic joy over your breakthrough for us. You're kind and tenderhearted to those who don't deserve it and very patient with people who fail you. Your love is like a flooding river overflowing its banks with kindness. God, everyone, everyone sees your goodness for your tender love is blended into everything you do. You know, for all of my life, all I have known is God's love. Even in stressful times, like when people I loved got sick or died, God's love covered me. His love is magnanimous, even though he hates the sin evil people do, he also loves them. And if they will repent, he will save them. And if not, then they have made their own choice of where they will spend eternity. So think about the two thieves on the cross. Scholars say that those who were sentenced to die on the cross back in those days were likely violent highwaymen who murdered people and stole everything they had. Some were rebel rousers stirring up people against the Roman Empire or maybe like Jesus against the church. Some were those who had been caught doing something else that didn't fit into societal norms. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what the two thieves has, had done, but since they were called thieves, they were likely the more violent types who murdered and robbed. Luke 23, 29 tells us that one of the thieves scoffed at Jesus and told him, hey, prove that you're the Messiah by saving yourself and coming down off of that cross and taking both of us with you, you know, take us off of the crosses too. That guy, he was not sorry for what he did, right? Then Luke 23, 40 through 43 gives the narrative of the other thief. But the other criminal protested, 
Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. <clears throat> now, to me, this story shows what happens when a wicked person repents, even on his deathbed. Both of these were criminals. The second man didn't try to convince anyone that he was a good man who just got caught in a difficult situation. He admitted his sin. He confessed that he deserved to die. Then, by acknowledging that only Jesus could rectify his wrong, he asked that Jesus remember his confession. And of course, Jesus affirmed and accepted him. This is the love of God in action. It's that over-the-top kind of love that says, even though God hates humanity's rebellion against him, including <clears throat> things like lying, scheming, gossiping, stealing, killing, and hurting each other, he still desperately wants us to be saved and live forever with him. You know, watching mankind's continual disobedience to him is why God sent his precious son, his only son, to die for us. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us of God's heart towards all people. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Did you hear that little word, all? Even the sinners, even the wicked, the ones who right now are not repenting. In clear and plain language, God is saying that he would love it if even the most wicked person would repent and come to him. He even wants those who think they're too far gone for him to accept them to come to him because he loves us. And for the life of me, I have no idea why he kept wooing me to come back to him and do what he told me to do for years. I'm just glad he did. And I'm glad God supernaturally set up a situation where I could really hear what he'd been saying to me for years and why it was important. But the entire aspect of hatred for evil and love for those who are following God is really kind of unbelievable. You know, I've searched my brain to think if I've ever really hated anyone. I don't think I have, but I think I've gotten a step or two away from hate. Maybe that would be assumed to be hate. I've wanted bad things to happen to people who did wrong to those I love. And I've also been angry with those same people. God also hates what those people did, yet he still loves them and wants them to repent and come to him. Romans 5, 6 through 10 tells us, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet still sinners, wicked in his sight, that's my aside, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were in, for if while we were enemies, 
we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been recon reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus died for sinners. We can't deny that we are all in that category. The problem is we also categorize sins. We think, <clears throat> well, my sin isn't as great as that wicked guy who murdered four, four college students. Well, of course it isn't. Or is it? 1 John 3, 14 through 15 has a few things to say about that. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. He who does not love remains in spiritual death. Everyone who hates works against his brother is at heart a murderer by God's standards. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's a wow, right? I mean, we've heard it before, but this is what God is telling us. Hate is as bad as murder. The Bible dictionary defines hate this way. Hate derives from a strong dislike or ill will toward person, persons or things. As an emotional attitude, a person may oppose, detest, or despise contact with a thing or person. Now, <clears throat> there are varied degrees of hate, of course. For instance, I hate watermelon and coffee. I know a lot of people love it. I hate it. <clears throat> I des despise even touching watermelon, and I hate the smell of coffee. I can't put up with them both, right? But I would never eat watermelon or drink coffee. Those are preferences of mine. But to hate a person is different. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us that we are to love our enemies, or in other words, those who hate us. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, and this is in the Amplified just because I like the way it says it. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, your fellow man, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may show yourselves to be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on those who are evil and those who are good and makes the rain fall on the righteous and those who are morally upright and the unrighteous, the unrepentant, those who oppose him. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessing and peace, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles who do not know the Lord do that? You, therefore, will be perfect, growing into spiritual maturity, both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life as your Father and as your Heavenly Father is perfect. So part of growing into spiritual maturity is learning how to love others who may not be the most lovable. As a matter of fact, they may be our enemies. They may hate us. So how do we love them? First of all, we must forgive them. Forgiveness, in addition to setting you free, will moderate your interactions with those you hate. It will open doors for you to do the one thing that shows love to them the most, and that's to invite them to get to know Jesus. There is no greater love than doing that for another person. And if they reject your offer, then pray for God to set up situations in their lives to cause them to want to understand more about him. Um, the prayer I'd like to pray is God do whatever it takes to bring them to you. 
Jesus tells us to go even farther, though. In the Passion Translation, Matthew 5, says, I say to you, love your enemy, bless the one who curses you, do something wonderful for the one who hates you, and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. Okay, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, but you don't know what that so-and-so did to me. I will never forgive him. I will never in a thousand years pray for God to bless him. Or you don't know what he did to my daughter or to my, or she did to my son or whatever. Remember what Jesus said. Matthew 6, 12 in the New Living Translation says, Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And then a few verses later, Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And trespasses are basically sins. So when I forgive others, even for the things that may have happened years ago, it sets me free. And when I am set free, I am able to ask God to bless them. I can go from hatred or great dislike or fear or anger to a God-directed love. That doesn't mean they have to be in my life anymore, but it does mean I can pray for God to change them. If it takes blessing them to do that, then I'm all in because maybe it will stop them from hurting someone else. Jesus really didn't give us a roadmap to follow when he told us to love our enemies. It's really kind of counterintuitive to what we as humans want to do. We want to seek revenge. It's in our DNA to do that. Once we have discovered, though, how to love those who hate us, we will be less encumbered with worry. We can also begin to see that we can be maybe one small spoke in this gigantic wheel of humanity that stops trying to destroy others. Forgive, bless, and pray. Those are three of the greatest words in the English language. Now, as a coach, I talked to a lot of people, and the other day someone told me that they hated a person they had once loved who had done them wrong, and I kind of understood where their hate was coming from. I knew the pain they were feeling. I could see it in their eyes. I wanted to help them, but I also know that hate and love are two sides of a very similar coin. If we have loved someone deeply, passionately, and they throw us a curveball or leave us or do us wrong in some way, our love can turn to hate in seconds. Both of these emotions reside in the same area of the brain, and scientists can tell that both are intense emotions, same intensity. They can tell the difference between the two. Supposedly, hate involves more of a thinking response than love does. So it's true that we fall in love without thinking. It's more of an emotional response. Uh, but when love goes south, it turns into hate, which is a calculated passion. Hate, when we hate someone, we plot our next move. This takes all of our time, thought, and energy. When we hate someone, they kind of like hijack our brain. That person we once loved, the one we should be moving on from and not thinking about, still has our brain captured. This might be why Jesus told us to love our enemies. Don't let them take over your thoughts 24-7. 
that will only end in destroying you. And you, you might say, well, they destroyed me, which would also be right. However, when we hate with this kind of constant day and night thinking, we are allowing them to continue to control us and destroy us. Now, Paul had, I think, more of a right to hate a bunch of people than we do. But listen to what he says in Romans 12, 17 through 19. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone's everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Now, these verses tell us, us that our jobs are really different from God's. He's the judge. He can take revenge. That's not our job. That's not what we are supposed to be doing. Our job is to show love to those people so that they may one day repent and come to Jesus. So God really does have some pretty big standards for his children. John 15, 12 through 14 says, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And then in 1 John 3, 16, it says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. You know, the Apostle John is also the one who explained the importance of not hating others. First John 2, 9 through 10, he says, Another who claims to be in the light, but, who, but hates a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing to make them stumble. The way God loves us shows us how to love others. His love covers us in every way. Psalm 36, 7 says, How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. God's love protects us and answers our cries for help. Psalm 94, 18 through 19 in the Passion Translation says, When I screamed out, Lord, I'm doomed. Your fiery love was stirred and you raced to my rescue. Whenever my busy thoughts were out of control, the soothing comfort of your presence calmed me down and overwhelmed me with delight. God's promises can be trusted because he never stops loving us. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you. And he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. That's Psalms 100 verse 5. That's an amazing, amazing God that we serve. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for covering me with your love. Thank you that you provided a way for me and all of humanity to be saved if we choose to accept Jesus as our Savior. Please let me know if there's anyone I hate, dislike, or despise. Help me forgive and bless and pray for them. Help me to stop allowing them to hijack my thoughts. I forgive them. I hand them to you. I desire your love to flow, flow through me 
to others. Teach me how to love even those who hate me who are, or who have done me wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, I hope this episode has been helpful. Going from hate to love and back again is uh, kind of difficult. We always need to be focusing on love. You know, Overcomers Christian Weight Loss Academy's doors are open now. So join us by going to TeresaShieldsParker.com Overcomers. That link will be in the show notes. Until next week, my friends, sweet grace for your journey.